Hepinize iyi günler diliyorum değerli katılımcılar. Bugünün Laparoskopik Cerrahi Kongresi'nin son oturumlarından ventral fıtık onarımında güncel yaklaşımlar başlıklı oturumu açıyorum. Profesör Doktor Selin Kapan da birlikte bu toplantıyı moder edeceğiz. Ee, şimdi ilk konuşmacımız, konuşmacıların sırası değişti. Ee, Profesör Dieter Berger'i ilk alacağız çünkü uçağa yetişmek zorunda. Onun konuşması bittikten sonra sorularınız varsa sorabilirsiniz. Onları cevaplandırmak için zamanın olduğunu söyledi. Ee, Dieter Berger'i e, davet ediyorum. Mrs. Chair. Mrs. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much once more for the invitation to that nice Congress here. I enjoyed it really very much and it's a great pleasure for me. However, the topic consensus on incisional hernia was one of my most difficult presentations I ever had to prepare. And there are some reasons. And the main reason is the lack of scientific of really real scientific data to give a real consensus. If you look on the, on the guidelines, for example, of the International Endohernia Society, then you see that they took together all papers which have been uh, um, published for a special topic and then they conclude from these papers. But that's not the way how to do it. First of all, you have look on the quality of the papers. And when the quality is adequate, then you can take conclusions, draw conclusions from such a paper, not take a paper and draw conclusions without looking on the quality. And my aim today is to give you some proposals to think about your own algorithms about hernia therapy. First of all, what we want to um, achieve when we try to repair an, an, an incisional hernia. Yesterday, Salvador Morales Conde clearly told us that we moved to the anatomic reconstruction. We want to have a functional restoration of the abdominal wall, and that only works with an real anatomic reconstruction. That's the main aim of our, um, of our procedures. But when we talk about anatomical reconstruction in the midline, we should also think about the dorsal rectus sheath. There is no publication um, really um, dealing with the role of the dorsal rectus sheath. And if we have major defects, we leave it open. We close the peritoneum, but we cannot close the dorsal rectus sheath. So this is, this is one point which underlines that is no real anatomical reconstruction, only one aspect. And if we look on component separation techniques, we cut the transverse abdominal muscle or we cut the anterior Mu uh, oblique muscle or the, the tendon of the anterior oblique muscle. That means we destroy the, an, the real anat anatomy and we cannot achieve an optimal functional reconstruction if we use component separation technique. When we look on the mass sutures which are used in lab ipon plus to close the defect, that's not an anatomical reconstruction. It's only tension and nothing else. Of course, we want to treat also the symptoms, which are mainly pain strangulation and the reduction of the protrusion, which is disturbing the patient, of course. And we want to produce long-lasting results. When we talk about incisional hernia and how to treat them, I want to point out once more, it's since 20 years, it's clear it's a collagen-based problem. It's a biological problem, not a mechanical one. And if we have a lot of other papers with the protease inhibitors, with, my, with the proteases responsible for turnover of collagen elastase and so on in the meantime, in summary, the patient cannot produce a stable scar. So we need a non-absorbable synthetic mesh in all cases. 
it must be non-absorbable. And if we look on the pathogenesis, we must also accept that we do only palliation. We do not treat the hernia disease. We treat the symptom of the dehiscence of the protrusion, but we do not treat the underlying disease. Um, when we accept that we need mesh, then we should also think what do we need, which kind of mesh do we really need. We need a non-resorbable mesh which should provide adequate stability for the whole rest of the life of the patient. It should have low bacterial adherence. For example, polyester have a very high bacterial adherence. Therefore, you ha will have more infections than with uh, mesh, mesh materials with low bacterial adhesions. The foreign body reaction should not be very aggressive and uh, there should not be a lot of foreign body reaction. And another point which is completely forgotten, there should be no release of additional substances from the mesh material like softeners. They can responsible for the so-called Schoenfeld syndrome. I will come back in a few minutes. If you have the possibility to visualize your mesh after the procedure, after implantation, it can be quite helpful. And we should look on the pore size and the so-called effective porosity, that means the pore size after incorporation and after the always working shrinkage of the mesh. Do we have such a material? I think we have a good material. Yes, we have. Polyester is clearly broken in a few years. That's well known and that has been well described. Polypropylene is also broken down in some years, which came from the gynecologists with, with, the, with the bands in, in, in continent surgery. But polypropylene is really degraded over time. It lasts longer than polyester, but it occurs. Polyvinylidane fluorid has a guaranteed stability. There, were, there is there will nothing happen with the material over years, over a lot of years. And this has uh, been very uh, effectively demonstrated in this recent paper, and not only in this one. The bacterial adherence is lowest in polyvinylidane fluorid, the foreign body as well. The purity is almost 100% pure of PBDF. Where, uh, in the case of polypropylene, I don't speak about polyester anymore because that should be abandoned. Polyester, for polyester meshes, the Schoenfeld syndrome, it's an autoimmune, auto-inflammatory uh, syndrome induced by adjuvants. This is a known, a known um, rheumatologic problem which has been described after breast implantation but also uh, by Tavert in Netherlands in 40 patients with a, an, with a, a polypropylene mesh and which is very difficult to treat. Visualization is also possible with the PVDF. Iron-loaded meshes can be, there can be done in MRT, MRT MRI and a, a three-dimensional reconstruction. The pore size should be over one millimeter in order to get an effective pore size at the end. That means that you don't have a capsule around the mesh. You need ingrowth through the pores and then an adequate fixation. When we talk about the um, technical aspects, if we talk about midline hernias, of course, the midline, hernia, the midline hernias should be anatomically reconstructed, if possible, and stabilized mainly by a retromuscular mesh. There are a lot of papers showing that the complication rate using a retromuscular mesh is lower than an onlay mesh. Inlay should be forgotten. It can be done, of course, open or minimal invasive, uh, in minimal invasive technique. And um, the recurrence rate of an intra-abdominal mesh, 
laparoscopic eye palm or laparoscopic eye palm plus, if it's done properly, is comparable with the open approach and the infection rate is better in the laparoscopic approach. I will show it why this will be. The lateral hernias are complex hernias, are always complex hernias because you have the rib cage and you have the pelvic bone as landmarks. And if you have a lateral hernia, you have to place your mesh behind the rib cage and behind the pelvic bone. And that only works if you prepare preperitoneally, as you know from the tar. And therefore, all lateral hernias are more difficult than a simple midline hernia. And it's absolutely clear that if you, if you repair the, med, the lateral hernia, you need to place the mesh preperitoneally, even if it's necessary to cross the midline. Otherwise, you don't get enough uh, overlap at the rib cage and at the pelvic bone. The role of the extraperitoneal approach um, in the midline is very attractive. It can be done by minimal invasive procedure. There are a lot of papers, but there are not a real comparison between different techniques. And therefore, if you are, um, if, if you favor this kind of procedure, the ETAP, then you should look on your patients carefully in the long term. You should use a registry, a well-documented registry, in order to provide data for further studies with these procedures. At the moment, we have very good, very good results with these procedures in single hands. But whether it works, if a lot of surgeons will do that, that's not clear up to now. And if we talk about lap ipom lap ipom is the only real minimal invasive procedure because you don't prepare flaps of the abdominal wall. You make your adhesiolysis and you place your mesh. And that means this is really minimal invasive. That's what Anil Sharma and me has um, described in 2018 when there was a severe discussion and a strong discussion about the role of lap ipom and intraperitoneal meshes. Lap ipom plus seems to be produce better results, seem to produce better results than, than the uh, standard lap ipom. The lira, yesterday, uh, yesterday demonstrated by Salvador Morales Conde, is also mu much more minimal invasive than an ETAP because an ETAP is only a minimally invasive access for a maximal invasive intra, uh, not intra abdominal, uh, maximal invasive procedure inside the abdominal wall. That should be always kept in mind. Of course, if you talk about lab IPOM, you have reduced wound complication rates. That's clear from beginning on. Since 20 years, it's clear. That's the main advantage of lab IPOM. So think about lab IPOM if you have patients prone to infections, and then I think it's a good, uh, absolutely adequate therapy. The disadvantage is the intraperitoneal mesh, which every mesh produces adhesions. It's not true if somebody says, I have never seen adhesions. He has never looked for adhesions, but each intraperitoneal mesh will uh, produce adhesions. But these adhesions are not necessarily a problem. We have done thousands of them with three patients reoperated due to the adhesions. We had an increased rate of bowel injury and we had increased costs. But the increased rate of bowel injury is very slightly increased and a little bit, of course, dependent by the surgeon itself. When we talk about the abdominal wall defects, we have two aspects. We have the dimension of the, S of the defect, that means the width of the defect, but another point which is always forgotten or often forgotten is the compliance of the abdominal wall. 
if you remember, you have patients with a six centimeter uh, uh, defect, and it is really only it, you can really you can close it only with some tension. And another patient with 12 and 14 centimeters can be closed with only minor tension. And that's the compliance of the abdominal wall, which is not studied up to now. If you have uh, tension on your abdominal wall, or you suggest tension on the abdominal wall on, on the suture, then you can use botulinum toxin or the component separation technique. But the component separation technique in destroys the anatomy. That should be kept in mind. And you won't get an optimal function at the end after component separation technique. The anterior component separation techniques, I have done a lot of them anterior as well as posterior. The anterior component pro provides more facial, uh, myofascial advancement as the posterior one. How to avoid? component separation technique if you want to restore the anatomy and, and the function and reduce the complication rate which is, uh, or the, the, which is combined with the component separation technique. You can stretch the abdominal wall by botulinum toxin, by progressive pneumoperitoneum, and you can use since some time the so-called facial traction which has been very early described by Dietmar Euker in 2012. And now we have this kind of procedure. This is originally designed for the open abdomen, for closing patients after long-lasting intensive care with open abdomen. And you, in the meantime, we have a, it's a little bit different for the hernia purpose. And you can use intraoperative standardized facial traction. And the results are astonishingly. I tried it sometimes, and I was, I'm absolutely convinced that the, um, the rate of component separation techniques will be reduced by the facial traction, whether Botox can be combined with, uh, it can be combined with the facial traction. Of course, whether it's really necessary, it's not clear up to now. We have also used in laparoscopy cases or endoscopy cases. It worked very well, even in these cases, and it may expand the indication of the Lira technique. I talked with Salvador Morales a few weeks ago when I met him in Spain. So, in summary, you need to apply mesh based procedures, and if you use a mesh, think about whether a PVDF based mesh is not the best choice. From all our data, it is the best choice. Of course, it costs a bit more. The choice of the procedure should be based on your own experience, of course, but also on the real scientific data. And the manuscripts, the papers, should be read correctly. Retromuscular approach for the midline, open or minimal invasively, Preperitoneal approach in lateral uh, cases, open or robotics. Lab IPOM, Lab IPOM Plus. In Lab IPOM can be is possible. Lab IPOM Plus may be better in some cases. Lira is another uh, possibility. The component separation technique should not be a routine procedure. Especially the TAR should not be the routine procedure, as well as the anterior component separation. The TAR has the same complication rate as the uh, anterior component separation, which has been shown by a Belgian group. I think it was been, you could, le you could read it in, the, um, in a previous slide. The TAR is not the magic bullet. And in Germany, we have a saying, if you have a new hammer, you see everywhere nails and pins. So if you have the TAR, please don't see everywhere the underlying defects where you think you need to apply a TAR. The TAR is necessary in some cases, as well as the anterior component separation technique, but not in all cases, as it, it, as it, is, as it is done in the meantime in the United States. Thank you very much.
Teşekkür ederiz. Salondan birkaç soru alalım. Salondan yok herhalde. Melih Hocam sizin. Ee, e, çok güzel sunumunuz için çok teşekkür ederim öncelikle. E, gayet güzel bize özetlediniz. E, ben size e, ventral fıtık cerrahisinde e, robotik e, platformun nereye gittiğini ve gelecekte bununla ilgili ne düşünüyorsunuz? E, onu sormak istedim. The robotics are a new one. It's the new hammer. That's one aspect. And of course, robotics is very nice to play with. <laughs> I enjoyed it very much. But uh, we, up to now, we have no um, data showing that robotics is providing better results than endoscopic, laparoscopic procedures. That's the scientific basis. If you look on the United States and our American colleagues, they all use robotic TAR. Why do they use it? The TAR has a very high reimbursement and the robotic TAR an even higher uh, reimbursement. And that's the reason why they use it every, every time. And I think we need good studies. We, not, we need studies comparing different um, techniques and the newest one is the robotic of course and then in a few years we can really answer your question teşekkür ederiz başka e, soru var mı salondan peki e, doktor e, berger çok teşekkür ediyoruz